Thanks, Chrissy. This is Brian Dill. I think I'll jump ahead here today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Brian Dill. I, uh, I head up the International Tax Services Group here at Cherry Beckert. I've been doing this for 25 plus years, and uh, given the questions that we've seen over the last 60 to 90 days um, on the international tax front, we thought this would be a very timely um, discussion, both from what you need to be doing right now in 2020 uh, to manage your 2020 taxes and from a cash flow perspective, also for those on the finance side of the house or even at the, the management side of the house in your companies thinking about at the operating level of your supply chains whether that be in the tech sector or whether that be in the industrial sector either one of those your operating um, fellows are facing a lot of supply chain disruptions and what they may be doing uh, to your supply chain right now and how that may have tax cost unwittingly and, and how you can potentially manage that both in the short and intermediate term and from a long-term basis as you make you know, structural changes to your supply chain. Uh, with me today is Kirk Hesser, who heads up and leads our transfer pricing efforts here at Cherry Beckert. Uh, Kirk has been doing this for over two decades. He has extensive experience um, as a partner in a big four firm um, with supply chain. He and I have worked on supply chain engagements extensively, um, how those change, how people you know, occasionally don't recognize that simple changes are actually changes to your supply chain and can have very big tax costs. And uh, it's always better if we can plan into it rather than dealing with those type of things after the fact and the tax burden has already been triggered from the supply chain disruption. Sarah, next slide. Agenda, so we thought we would kind of level set the discussion today to really kind of talk about, we're gonna use hard data back in April and we'll talk a little bit about where that's gone since April, but really where the state of the economy is and what is driving things to kind of change all of our paradigm about how we're looking at, at our businesses and cash flow and things that we have set up our structures from a tax and finance operation for ongoing growth. And what happens when we are in this kind of uh, supply chain disruption and this type of economy? After that, we're going to turn this over to Kurt to talk a little bit about short-term actions and transfer pricing and other items you need to think about in transfer pricing right now today. Then we'll start to look at some intermediate term planning with supply chain, um, maybe some export subsidies as we change our supply chain to be more US-centric potentially, um, and also some regional benefits, talking a little bit about that. And then looking forward really quickly at the end of this, some of the things that are coming out for 2021 tax legislation, what we are seeing that is being bandied about, you know, it's really early in the game. We have an election coming up, so things can change drastically, of course. But I think we're, we want to put forward how the thinking in Washington is starting to change and that what we were seeing six months ago from a tax legislation perspective and what we're seeing now bandied about just it's a little bit different and uh probably from a planning perspective to start to think about what does my business look like if this is new tax legislation and then in the end really shortly key planning items to summarize and uh, go forward with. next slide sarah so where are we as of april 2020 um global economy you know, is down 3% um, projected on an annualized basis for the 2020. Um, we're looking at a 6% decrease in the U.S. economy um, year over year. This is worse than the 08, 09 financial crises that we occurred and the bankruptcies. So, you know, we're still seeing stimulus brought into the economy that's kind of covering some of this, but with job losses, and everything, the, uh, the the lack of growth and actually the, the recessionary, depressionary techniques that are taking place are quite dramatic and, and tremendous 
and of course that's going to change how we approach delivering service how you're going to change delivering services and products to your customers and how do you get it to those customers because obviously your customer mix will be changing the euro economy is even worse it's projected at almost eight percent down this year and what does that mean well that means that you know with all of the stimulus coming into the economy with the economy reducing in size and scale you know we are looking at a deficit of 2020 of 18 percent on an annualized basis um, and from a debt perspective for the first time ever you know we're looking at over a hundred percent um if you look at the imf way they measure that um you're really looking at closer to 130 percent the way the uh, cbo office does uh debt is they take out certain intra governmental transfers the imf puts that back in so if you want to look and do a compare and contrast to other countries at 130 percent you know the United States is looking at a debt level close to what we were used to seeing in Italy. So for the first time ever, some real stress in the US economy from a debt on a GDP basis. And so I think we're gonna experience different things and different talk about how much debt can the United States take on for the first time? Is this too much? How are we gonna get out of it? How are we gonna manage our deficits? So I think the, the idea of never-ending deficits and manageable debt we may be for the first time starting to think about what does that look like in the future and that really drives the next part of this equation is from a taxation perspective is is, is our tax burden is going to go up to pay for all this um, is that going to be one of the things that we're going to see and how do we manage that given that we've just had um, tremendous reduction in our tax uh, rates in the last few years from the 2017 Tax Reform Act. So I think the landscape is changing very quickly um, and that will have a great impact on how we forecast and plan from a tax and financial perspective. Sarah? All right, that brings us to our first polling question, which, uh, go ahead and get that launched. Uh, All right. Are you expecting increased sales and revenues in the second half of 2020? A, yes, modest gains. B, yes, robust gains. C, no remaining flat or declining. Or D, not sure. And um, Chrissy, I am having trouble getting this poll launched, so you may have to do it for me. All right, I am trying to launch it as well. We, we're struggling at the moment, but we'll, uh, so maybe we will move on while we figure out what's uh, what's going amiss with the polls and we'll come back to this one. I see some of you going ahead and answering in the questions pod. We appreciate that. Um, some comments here and uh, just trying to bring this down to a local level. All right, uh, Brian, we're gonna go ahead and move on while Chrissy figures out uh, what is holding up with GoToWebinar on the polling questions? So next up is, is to start talking about transfer pricing itself. All right, well, I'm gonna turn this over to Kirk Hester and really talking about, you know, transfer pricing in the short term. What do you need to be doing in 2020 right now? And I do mean right now with your ES payments, um, this is a, a today kind of thing, managing your 2020 transfer pricing and then longer term out. and so. Kirk, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thanks, Brian. And Sarah, you could, thank you. Uh, I guess for, for most of us, or most of the taxpayers, they're probably still in the middle of trying to document their 2019 intercompany transactions. And this is a typical routine for most. Um, most companies may have looked at their transfer pricing a little bit at the end of 2019, perhaps made some adjustments and then look to try to start documenting their intercompany transactions for 2019 earlier this year uh, or sometime after Q1 in 2020. And most multinationals roll, around, roll along with that kind of a process and they've probably been doing that for about the last decade. And I say decade 
because as Brian mentioned, it's probably been about that long uh, since a lot of these companies emerged from the last great recession. And like the Great Recession, the global lockdowns associated with COVID-19 will likely result in system-wide losses for many multinationals. And what we've learned from past recessions is that maintaining status quo with regard to transfer pricing policies in the middle of these system-wide losses can have significant adverse impacts on a multinational's cash flow as well as where they're paying, where they're paying tax. So um, what we're going to advise taxpayers is to start looking at 2020 early. And in particular, look at the different types of intercompany transactions you have and the, and the types of entities you have in your supply chains and, and what short-term changes need to be made to, or perhaps made to transfer pricing policies and where are your cash needs, um, given everything that's going on with COVID-19. And then start to get into a little bit more of an intermediate view in terms of given everything that's going on, and we've had entire countries shut down um, for a period of time, weeks, months, and inability for countries to have manufacturing done in certain locations they're in. Um, what supply changes are uh, people considering and what are the transfer pricing ramifications of changing their supply chains or uh, moving functions, risks, or assets throughout the supply chain. But uh, let's back up for a second, uh, if you could, Sarah, next slide. When you look at many multinational supply chains and their transfer pricing, a lot of them have what are called limited risk entities uh, in these supply chains. And that may mean, like in the picture, the parent company sells goods to a limited risk distributor, or perhaps you have entities in the supply chain that provide services um, to the parent company or other companies in the chain on a contract basis. Uh, think about contract manufacturers or contract service providers. Well, the problem in when you have a recession like this and system-wide losses is that most, uh, most multinationals set their transfer pricing policies so that these limited risk entities earn a set operating profit. Uh, think about net cost pluses or return on sales for distributor. Um, but the result being that limited risk entities are earning profits regardless of volumes and regardless of the amounts of operating costs. Well, what that also means is that with system-wide losses, through transfer pricing, you're essentially sending dollars out into the system to maintain these transfer pricing policies, and that results in paying tax in locations where you may not necessarily need to in what we're calling tax leakage. and since you're sending dollars out into the system and some of those dollars are leaving the system through taxation, uh, it, it may result in some cash flow issues. So with system-wide losses and limited risk entities, the question becomes, uh, do these limited risk entities have to earn profits? Um, can they be break-even or can they earn losses in economic conditions like we have right now and then ultimately, you know, how do we support that if we think that that, uh, that can be done? But before we talk about that a little bit further, uh, Sarah, next slide. Also, the other intercompany transactions that you commonly see in a supply chain are just charges for intellectual property or charges for management fees and uh, back office services, as well as funding or financing a parent company might be providing to subsidiaries. And the question we commonly get asked for these types of intercompany transactions is, you know, can we suspend these types of payments um, 
most of our subsidiaries are making losses and really can't support these charges right now, uh, can they be temporarily suspended or reduced? So when you think about losses in limited risk entities and temporarily suspending these types of charges, a lot of multinationals are reluctant to do this because practitioners and tax authorities have repeatedly told them over the years that limited risk entities should always make money, always make profits, and uh, your intercompany agreements are, uh, you know, a deal's a deal according to the tax authorities. So if you're if you're charging a royalty, you can't really suspend or reduce those. But with system wide losses and um, these questions in mind, uh, you know, the question really is 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 that necessarily the case? And one thing we learned from the last Great Recession is, is really how tax authorities react to uh, losses in limited risk entities and suspending these types of policies uh, because we went through a lot of audits with our clients um, you know, in the wake of the last recession. And we figured out what they want to see and uh, you know, how to support suspending transfer pricing policies or putting losses in limited risk entities? And the short answer to the question is yes, um, these, these positions can be supported, um, but there are several steps that a multinational should take in order to uh, make these uh, temporary changes to their policies happen. And Sarah, next slide. So the last thing that we would advise companies to do is to treat their transfer pricing actions and documentation like they probably are for 2019, going back to what we were saying at the outset. In other words, waiting till the end of the year to take action and then trying to document their policies at, the, uh, at, at some time next year. Um, tax authorities really react better when you're taking these types of actions if you do them contemporaneously with what's going on, which would mean right now. And one of the things that we learned after the great, the last great recession was that tax authorities always want to look at your intercompany agreements. And it's typically the first thing that they, they look at when you're trying to support losses in limited risk entities or suspending uh, transfer pricing policies. And within your intercompany agreements, you're gonna to wanna to have adjustment clauses. And the one that you're going to wanna to look for, which is very similar to what you see in all third party arrangements, would be these force majeure clauses. And a lot of those mentions specifically mention pandemics as a reason to depart from the agreement conditions or pricing. Um, but you're going to want to have those in your intercompany agreements. Um, and, and that shows that you're behaving like a third party, for one thing, and then also that you've contemplated these types of adjustments and the need to make them ahead of time as opposed to after the fact. And if you don't have intercompany agreements in place, we would strongly recommend that, uh, that you put some in place, uh, again, uh, starting now. The other action that companies are going to want to take in the short term, and, and that probably means now, is really to model the impact of COVID-19 on global forecasts and cash needs. And once you've done this, you'll be able to determine uh, what changes need to be made or how big a changes need to be made to your transfer pricing policies and start implementing those today, as opposed to trying to make large adjustments at year end. Uh, and this will also put the uh, organization in a position, as Brian mentioned at the outset, to contemplate those ES payments and uh, likely reduce those uh, significantly. And then lastly, um, your transfer pricing studies. Uh, you're going to want to start considering how you're going to document what's going on in 2020 uh, now, again, as opposed to waiting till, um, 
so sometime in 2021 to start trying to pull that together. And next slide, Sean. And again, that's that's really a repeat of everything we just said. So I'm going to ask you to forward again, Sarah. So when we talk about 2020 transfer pricing documentation, uh, it, it is going to be different. It's going to be unique um, in that, again, we are going to be trying to support losses and in some cases suspending or uh, eliminating certain intercompany transactions such as royalties and management fees um, and and again the time to do that would probably be to start now and in particular start looking at what that 2020 narrative is going to look like um, meaning that you'll want to update your narrative and explain qualitatively and quantitatively COVID 19's impact on the organization um, you'll likely want to update any industry analyses that you've conducted in years past and, and really explain the virus's impact on your industry as well. And also want to mention for taxpayers that are expecting less transfer pricing audits because of global losses, uh, one of the other things we learned from the past recession is, is that's not the case. In coming years, government budgets will be even more strained and tax authorities will be looking for revenues. Uh, transfer pricing always comes up as a chief source of tax revenue. And again, um, the time to document this is while everything is fresh in mind. And almost as importantly, or equally as importantly, um, you're going to want to contemplate how to handle your comparables benchmarking. Tested parties will likely be outside of comparable ranges. Um, transactions will be outside of their comparable ranges. And so it's going to take a different look or, uh, at the comparables and how to best document it. Um, for example, there, there are always database time lags. Um, if you prepare your documentation early enough, typical databases used for comparables will not have 2020 data yet when you start to look at this early in 2021. So you're either going to have to wait, and that's usually not a problem if you extend your tax returns, or you may have to look at um, quantitative screens. And by quantitative screens, I mean typically most practitioners and taxpayers when they're screening for comparables and doing their comparable searches will put in uh, quantitative screens so that they only locate comparables that earn profits. Um, obviously, we may want to relax that screen given the economic conditions so that we find comparables under similar conditions. And then another, um, another thing that I've seen done on audits or that's been used is also is to contemplate uh, comparing your tested parties to similar time frames. And we mentioned the the prior recession. It it might uh, it might make sense to look at a similar time frame, like the early recession, where a lot of companies were making losses, and compare that to your current tested parties. And then lastly, you might want to consider adjustments um, to third-party comparables, such as excess capacity adjustments or working capital adjustments really just to try to make those comparables more apples to apples to your tested parties. So in summary, in light of COVID-19 and its uh, drastic effects on the global economy, uh, taxpayers should really start thinking proactively about their transfer pricing policies now. Um, they should take action to make sure their policies reflect economic reality and take defensible steps to lessen strains on cash flow and prevent that tax leakage we talked about before. Um, and then lastly, it's critical to ensure that proper documentation is in place to support those lost positions within your intercompany agreement, as well as your transfer pricing documentation. And next slide, Sarah. And now we're going to shift gears slightly into more of the intermediate term planning and um, really thinking about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in light of what's, happen what's happened, a lot of 
our clients are looking at their supply chains and um, you know contemplating moving manufacturing as well as other functions just in light of the fact that uh, countries shut down during this uh, during this pandemic and it really threw a wrench into a lot of supply chains um, but one thing to always contemplate when those changes are being made or contemplated is transfer pricing and um, moving functions, moving risks, or moving assets always has transfer pricing ramifications. And uh, one thing that might have to be dealt with when you do move those functions, risks, or assets are exit costs from uh, certain uh, countries and, and how best to deal with those. And we'll talk about those a little bit more throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation, but for right now, um, I will turn it over to Brian to talk about the, the other things that can be contemplated along with moving manufacturing, our governmental incentives, and then move into some of the, the U.S. tax impacts. Brian? Thanks, Kirk. Hey, Sarah, can you go back one slide? Yeah, Kirk, I had a question. You know, uh, most of the time when it comes to transfer pricing, you know, we, we all, we, we have it in our plan, we get it done contemporaneously with part of our tax return filings. Um, you know, and we, we use an estimate, but it's rarely over the estimate. This year, you know, when you're talking, when you were talking about you know, quantitative screens and comparable time periods and adjustments, you know, looking at it from an ES payment here um, in, in, in your second quarter, um, and then all the way through to 2020 documentation and finalization, I mean, I could, I could be way off, right, from what I, you know, what I want to do now compared to, and how, how do I manage that with you you know, from a transfer pricing perspective, given that the numbers, the actual databases aren't going to be released until, you know, Q1 2020? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, I think that um, what I would recommend is going back to really trying to model and um, forecast the uh, rest of the year and if not starting to model 2021 as well. But certainly look at um, what you are forecasting for global losses. And you know, it, it may get back to looking at those limited risk entities and uh, as well as how, how big of a loss can we support with comparables. And um, we won't have current data for 2020 uh, like I said, till 2021, but this may go back to look at what happened to distributors during the last recession. And again, if you relax those uh, screens in terms of locating comparables and having the, the screen make them so that they make money, if you relax that screen and look at what happened to comparables during the last recession, it may give you an idea of how big of a loss you can support in one of your distributors or one of your contract manufacturers or cost plus entities. And then I would recommend working backwards from there in terms of it really what amounts to a loss split in, in terms of sharing the losses is if you know you can support a certain amount of loss in a tested party and then again, the residual loss comes back to the parent company it will give you an idea then how to modify transfer pricing and push that through to things such as uh, ES payments for the rest of the year. That's a good point. I think the other thing, um, you know, you look back to the 08 financial crisis, I think what we did see from an intercompany pricing perspective are those companies that waited to almost the time of the tax return to do their transfer pricing and finalize it. And given the, the huge disruption, if you're gonna wait that long, especially if you are a company that has an audit and you're gonna wait to do that, you know, if you don't do it by the time you close your books and your audit, 
there's a significant likelihood that the numbers for the tax return could have a very material from the time you do your tax provision until the time you do your tax return and having a provision to return true up. Those true ups under transfer pricing can be so large um, in these years of disruption that, that we don't like to talk about it, you know, but it's something you need to, to really think is, you know, financial statement restatements um, because of the material in the wrong period um, and having to restate your financial statements because of transfer pricing. Um, and you didn't get it right for 2020. So, you know, not just from a cash flow, but if you have audited financial statements and you wait too late um, and having a, a restatement issue, that that can also be a big issue because the numbers are changing so big um, in, in these particular years. Um, anything to add to that, Kirk? Yeah, and, and I think when you really look at it, best case scenario versus worst case scenario, when you're making transfer pricing adjustments, um, obviously, the best case scenario would be to do it now during the course of the year. Um, and then you move along that continuum at the end of the year before you close your books is is still a, a good option. Um, but again, tax authorities don't generally like to see you wait that long and make large transfer pricing adjustments. And then the worst of all scenarios is to wait till after the end of the year when you close your books and then you have to start contemplating things like tax only adjustments uh, or tax return only adjustments and whether or not those are even permissible. A good point, Kirk. Thanks a lot for that. As Kirk mentioned, moving to this slide, intermediate term planning, you know, I think we are hearing a lot about how are companies able to meet their client needs and how are they nimble uh, to go out and get the products they need um, to handle their cash flow issues. And so that really means at a base level, changing your supply chain. And in the intermediate term, when you start to look at your supply chain, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those functions and things to consider. Um, we want you to consider when you do that, you know, governmental incentives that are out there. If you're going to move your supply chain, you're going to think about moving some of your production back from China you know, starting to look at more of the regional opportunities that can be very advantageous. Just dropping those here, you know, it's the, you, you talk about Maquiladoras, that's the IMAX program in Mexico. If you look at the Honduras opportunities and the free trade zones there, um, those type of opportunities are still there. Um, they have lower labor costs, they have great work um, uh, parks, uh, business parks there. Um, we, we do have several clients that work through those type of programs and those type of opportunities are great um, because, you know, if structured properly, uh, you can move your supply chain back to the U.S., still use those regional incentives across North America, and then as we'll talk about later, still be able to take advantage of um, foreign derived intangible income benefits, export subsidies out of the U.S., and um, our, our, this was IC disc benefits um, to be taken for, care of. Next slide, Sarah. All right, we are up to our next second poll question. Uh, we apologize, but GoToWebinar has had some uh, issues with their poll function today. So if you will please answer in the question pod, uh, we will register your name. So all we need is uh, number two and uh, A, B, or C. And uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to share the results with you, but if you'll go ahead and in the question pod, put two and then either A, B, or C. And for those that missed uh, the first question, uh, we'll circle back to that one at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you already answered in the question pod, uh, you're fine. And we'll not need to answer question one again, but if you missed your opportunity there, we will circle back so you have that opportunity. Uh, so again, just type a two and then a letter. I see that's uh, that's happening and that is perfect. Thank you for being flexible and working with us uh, through this issue. All right, I'll go ahead and move on. Um, and again, some more conversation about changing your supply chain. Thanks, Sarah. Next slide. So when we talk about changing our supply chain, you know, I just put a few examples here. I think we have been moving over the last you know, 30 years um, to have 
centralized supply chains that where we have gained efficiencies in particular jurisdictions from either a cost or a productivity perspective. And we've seen that, you know, so you, you have foreign R&D centers, as I said here, you have your treasury operations in, um, in like a London or a, a Luxembourg, foreign services companies that are in jurisdictions where, you know, if you're an IT company, you've moved your, you know, certain IT functions that you're outsourcing internally to foreign service companies in India, or potentially you've moved back office services to Poland. You know, all of these jurisdictions have been highly competitive to attract investment, um, to increase their employment standards and increase their way of life there. And they've, they've had huge rates of growth from an economic perspective in these countries. Um, and, and we've seen it all over. We see foreign contract manufacturers, you know, the, the big ones, of course, you see that in China, but you also see that in you know, Thailand, you see that in Vietnam, Southeast Asia has been tremendous in these operations. And then of course you have foreign sales offices um, that know the market, know the region, you're hiring people that have expertise in that. Well, if, if now you need or desire to modify your supply chain, you know, how are you gonna avoid the to avoid global supply chain disruptions. How are you gonna become more nimble? You know, it's not gonna be as centralized, but you're having to answer to potential supply chain disruptions and become more nimble. And then how are you gonna avoid the additional cost of local government protectionist measures? Because what we're seeing is more nationalization. We're seeing more protectionist measures. And so how do you deliver to the local market or your big markets and how do you have move your supply chain there? Uh, those are the big questions that are coming up. We don't have all the answers today, but here's a, a few things to consider. Next slide. So some things to start to consider if you're gonna do that, is your, you know, if you're gonna move certain attributes or certain functions or risk from these things, you know, you can trigger unintentional consequences. And so we, we want to look at your capital structure. You know, you put capital overseas, you have debt, you have equity flows. You know, a change to your supply chain, you know, you still have put that debt or you put that equity there. How do you wind down that? You know, you have an investment in that country. You know, it's really easy. The operating people say, well, I just want to move here. Well, that may not be possible from an equity perspective. Uh, getting your equity out of these countries may not be easy without triggering a tax event. Um, it also can to register the shares or wind down the operations in these countries can be very complex. Um, also, unrealized gains. You have probably built up gains in these countries that are un, that you may not know about, and you may be moving your supply chain and triggering those gains. And in a year, you may be least likely to afford a tax bill and you're looking at losses, um, triggering those gains and having a tax bill. Also, looking at tax attributes and tax holidays. Uh, a lot of times operating people don't think about, they only think about the cash flow, and they don't think about the tax assets that you all have built up. They don't think about the tax holidays you may be under. And with these tax holidays, a lot of times you have made a commitment to the government. Let's say it's a five-year holiday. Well, that, that means that you've had to meet certain marks for five years. Let's assume you're in your third year of a tax holiday and now you want to immediately change your supply chain and migrate it back to the United States. Well, if you do that, you may not honor your tax holiday commitment of five years. And therefore, you know, the first three years, if you don't honor those commitments, they could go back and charge you the full rate of tax on those first three years that you're already through. So, you know, looking at your tax attributes, looking at your tax holidays, and whether you're going to trigger a tax event um, by changing your supply chain are big things. Withholding taxes, you know, moving your supply chain, moving caches can trigger large withholding tax obligations, and we don't always recognize those things. Also, a lot of other times we don't recognize that there are local corporate statutory reserves requirements. So you want to move cash out of a certain jurisdiction and you're looking at the financial statements 
yes, you may have retained earnings, but in certain jurisdictions, you have to look at the local statutory accounts. All those statutory audits you go through and you finish them and you shelve them, well, you gotta look at those statutory accounts and you gotta look at the statutory reserve mechanisms. You may have cash and think excess cash, but you may not be able to access that cash because you have statutory reserve requirements and you may be limited on the amount of cash you can distribute. Also, some countries do not allow you to make distributions you know, monthly. Sometimes you're limited to only certain times of the year to make corporate distributions. So things like that, that really, when you need to access cash, you need to change your supply chain, going through those and checking those would be, are, are very important things to remember. Next slide. So here are some typical tax considerations, very, very simple. You know, you have a foreign sales office and you've decided to move the foreign sales people back into the US. You know, A is you're moving them back and B is US parent foreign sales, you're gonna consolidate that. You know, hey, we're gonna consolidate, we're gonna save money, we're gonna let people go. Well, to do that, you know, your foreign sales office are the intangible assets of that foreign sales offices. Do you have customer list? Do you have other items of intangible? If you migrate those people back into the United States, do you have a taxable gain? And not only do you have a taxable gain on the intangibles, do you have a hidden dividend distribution on that gain? So big issues. Also, indirect tax issues with that. And you know, if you're continuing to make sales into that foreign country, are you registered for VAT? Is the US parent company registered for VAT? Will you have to register for VAT? How do you get your input VAT back? Are you going to have cash flow issues there? Also, to migrate people out of a foreign country, you know, and change that. You know, you got local payroll tax audits. You have sometimes unions. Sometimes you have the inability to fire people quickly. It's not always a contract at will like it is in the United States. That's why there's labor, labor law considerations. You know, liquidation taxation, timing and clearances. Those things can take months if not years sometimes in foreign jurisdictions and so those of us in the financial side of the house we hear operating companies say hey make it happen today um, but sometimes there's governmental interference there in our ability to actually make it happen today and there's real need for cash flow so taking the time quickly to think about that sometimes saving a few dollars on foreign salespeople eliminating those jobs and migrating them back to the U.S., you know, occasionally you can have a larger tax bill, i.e. cash flow issue, by migrating it back to the United States than you would have had if you had just kept them employed. So little things just like that, and we're not even talking big items on the supply chain, can have a real impact of what we've done. And we just want you to think about those things as you go through your global supply chain and you're making moves to that. Next slide. In addition to um, moving your supply chain, we just wanted to highlight, you know, the U.S. does have some, some very advantageous export tax incentives. So if you're looking at migrating your supply chain or changing your supply chain at this point, and you want to do more outside of the United, more in the United States and make more sales from the United States, there's a couple of really good export tax incentives to really think about. Next slide. So, you know, for most people, more than 90% of the global market for goods and services outside the United States. We think these type of opportunities are big opportunities for you. We have several clients to take advantage of them and they can have real advent advantages. Next slide. So what's the benefit for FDII? I think the number one thing is Foreign derived intangible income has to be the absolute worst name I've ever heard because it has virtually nothing to do with intangible income. And so I think a lot of people see this term foreign derived intangible income or FIDI, and they think that, oh, well, I'm a 
industrial company. I don't deal in intangibles. This doesn't apply to me. Actually, it really does apply to you, and you should think about taking advantage of it. In fact, it probably applies to you more than other companies. And what's the benefit? If you're organized as a C corporation um, and your exports, you know, C corporations are taxed at 21%. Um, you can effectively move that rate down to 13 and an eighth percent. Um, it was beginning in 2018. You can still go back and amend your 18 return and claim the 50 deduction. It's a great benefit. It's you know off 21%, saves 8% practically. A great benefit that was given in the 2017 tax reform act. Next slide. Here's the company profiles. It's only available for USC corporations. We've helped several companies um, as they've gone through this and looked at that, reorganize into C corporation structures to do this. Uh, you need taxable income, of course, in order to take advantage of it. Um, but, and, and if you look here, the great thing is it is not just limited to products. You know, you can license your IP, it's royalties. There's various type of services. So if you're even providing services to, you know, your related parties, you may be eligible for an export of NFDII deduction. So great opportunity here for um, uh, those companies that are exporting products, licensing goods or services. So it's a broad swath. Uh, the only disadvantage is it's available only to C Corporation. And the last point is in this particular case, foreign includes Puerto Rico and US possessions. That's okay, Sarah, go ahead. Um, really quick example of just showing you um, what it is. And, and the reason, if you look at the first part of this example, deduction eligible income, assume you have, you know, a million dollars of foreign sales here. Uh, the one reduction is, and this is the reason they call it the intangible income, is on your tangible assets, essentially. Um, and that's the acronym QBAI, Qualified Business Assets. Um, there's a 10% haircut there. So to the extent you have tangible assets, the IRS or Congress deemed that it was too difficult to determine what the rate of return is on your tangible assets. So it's just across the board 10%. So the extent your eligible income exceeds a rate of 10% on your tangible assets, you're gonna have FDII income. And here is, you know, we assumed that it was a services company, for example, had very little tangible assets, and you get a, a million dollar eligible income. Um, and if you go to the second part on the second column, you know, you get the, the deduction, it works as a way of a deduction. And what you get is a 37.5% deduction, drives you to taxable income at 625. Corporate rates at 131,250 at 21 percent, but really what that means is it reduces your effective rate on that million dollars to 13 and 8 percent. So instead of spending, you know, instead of having 210 thousand dollars on it, you're only spending 130 thousand of tax on your deduction income. So as you can see, just a million dollars, you know, is saving. Something in order here, seventy thousand dollars. So big savings available from the FDII opportunity. And then Brian, you know, just my, a, buddy, uh, in real quick. Yeah. Uh, sure. It's, it's just I mean we, we think about FDII, and I guess kind of ironically we're thinking about turning off royalties or temporarily suspending royalties or or service payments. Um, but with regard to uh, FDII, there. I mean, we still encounter a lot of companies that never turned them on, um, and and that's uh, prior to the recession and during the recession. So certainly afterwards, it's something to consider. Uh, a lot of companies don't charge out for management fees or certain services that are beneficial to subsidiaries, and at the same time, don't understand how broad the definition of royalty is. And um, and royalties can be charged in a lot of cases to subsidiaries that are benefiting and and, and making sales to third parties and um, could be could pull them into FDII advantageously. Yeah. I agree, Kirk. That's a really big deal, especially you know if you're looking FDII. Essentially, you're going to be taxed at 13 and an eighth percent um, to the extent that you can 
charge for management services, charge for other types of services, license your IP to your related parties that may be paying tax in those foreign jurisdictions at much higher rates. You know, think about Germany paying a 30% tax rate. Um, and you essentially, what you're doing is you're, by being able through transfer pricing, you're able to migrate income in Germany that is subject to 30% tax rate to a 13 and an eighth percent tax rate by charging out for those functions and risk. So you're right, Kirk, that's a really big opportunity to kind of migrate income back into the US, you get it back where you need it, and you're being taxed on it at a much lower rate. Uh, Brian, we did have one question. Well, folks, if you have not answered polling question number three, please go ahead and in this last minute to do so. We did have one question that says, uh, if you have an NOL in 2020, is it, are you still eligible for a, a FIDI deduction? No, you don't get the deduction at that point. You know, you got to have taxable income to actually take advantage of it. You, you can take it, but, you know, do, do you want to? Yeah, you can't make your NOL bigger with that no. deduction. But you can make your NOL bigger, Sarah, by migrating that income back into the U.S. Like mm -hmm. we were talking, the, the whole transfer pricing issue here, right, is that you are otherwise paying tax on your subsidiaries around the globe. And through transfer pricing, um, are you able to migrate some of that income back into the US and enhance your NOLs? Because if at the end of the year, you're a global company that isn't going to be in a lost position, it really doesn't look good to be paying taxes in foreign, ta in foreign jurisdictions, simply because that's the way we did it last year. I mean, that's the really big message here is, it's a huge disruption to your supply chain. Really take a look at those intercompany relationships. And there's a lot, what I call tax leakage, that's occurring and people are gonna wake up in January of 2020 and, and think that, why, why am I paying tax in these foreign jurisdictions? All right, next, next slide looks like we're running up on time. So I'll go through this really quickly. Um, FDII is one export subsidy. This has been around for a long time. We know it's out there. Uh, we have several companies that use it. This has not gone away, um, is what we call the IC disc. It stands for Interest Charge Domestic International Sales Corporation. And essentially, what are the benefits? Uh, you get a deduction at the US operating company in the form of a commission. You have the opportunity up to $10 million of gross receipts to defer tax on your export profits. And your shareholders of the disc are essentially taxed at capital gains rates upon the receipt of dividends. So really what that does is, um, is migrate um, income that's otherwise taxable at ordinary rates to taxable at capital gain rates. That's really the play on an IC disc is you're arbitraging into uh, from ordinary to cap gains. Any type of entity can use the IC disc. It's not limited to C corps. It's a separate entity. The thing compared to the FDII, it's limited to the type of activities that qualify. So much narrower field on what is considered qualified export property. Um, export property must be produced in the US and it can't not be more than 50% attributable to foreign content. That can be a big misnomer. The way the valuation rules work on export property, like I was saying, just because you have a maquiladora, just because you're using Honduras, that does not mean that you're not going to meet the foreign content. Let's talk about that because I think that runs a lot of people off. But the way that the way the 50% content test is run, um, you'd be surprised how many companies still use their foreign uh, regional uh, service providers in order to still qualify for IC disc benefits. Next, Sarah. Next slide, Sarah. Ah, there we go. Quick example. Oh, quick example here. I'm going to have to go fast. I, but, but really, what I'm saying here is it's a big, long example to really show you that um, it's driving tax of savings of five and a quarter million dollars. What that really means is in this example, people are not paying at the individual rates at 37 and a half percent. They're really paying it at the cap gain rates of 21 percent. So on operating income, you're converting here, essentially 
your export sale income, you're converting that from ordinary to cap gain rates. It's a great opportunity to really think about these, you know, as you move your supply chain and are looking at exporting more goods. All right, Sarah, we'll finish up with uh, looking forward. Looking forward, we think, um, you know, looking at some of Biden's um, plans that he's putting forward and some of the Democratic plans that are putting forward, how are we going to pay for a date um, for uh, the debt? Uh, we're looking at increasing the corporate rate to 28% potentially, return of the AMT. They term it something differently, but really it's just another alternative minimum tax of 15%. Um, those of you that deal with guilty, uh, that's at 12.5%, they're looking at increasing that to 21%. Um, with the CARES Act, uh, the suspension of the 80% limit on NOLs and the five-year-old NOL carryback. So please take opportunity to take advantage of that today because that may be a short-lived thing as we go forward with 2021 tax legislation. Big thing is, um, for the first time in a long time, it looks like they're increasing rates as opposed to further tax reductions. That's really the big message there. Next slide. Things to consider really quickly, and we'll wind up. Transfer pricing, you know, economic conditions have changed. We've mentioned it several times today. Um, we think people are going to change their supply chain. They're looking at ways to satisfy needs, and that could have real uh, changes from an international tax and transfer pricing perspective. Look at regional tax incentives. Uh, you can still do U.S. exports and still take benefits of regional tax incentives through Mexico and Honduras and those opportunities. Um, you still are in a very competitive global environment, and uh, those things are going to be very important. And then it's going to be important that you model. You, you know, you could be in a higher tax environment. What is that going to look like? We haven't looked at such an environment in quite a few years. Uh, what does your cash flow and tax planning look like if we're going to be in a higher taxing environment? And that could be across the globe. All right. That brings us to our last uh, attendance poll question today. Again, if you would please answer in the questions box. Uh, so that we will be able to record this. We apologize that uh, GoToWebinar has had issues with the polling questions and made this more difficult for you. Uh, but we thank you, Brian and Kirk, for uh, your insight into uh, how to think differently about um, uh, activity going on between related parties across borders, because uh, life, uh, as we continue to hear, is not the same as it was. And we should not treat things the same and look at everything differently. Uh, so thanks for highlighting those uh, issues for us today and those opportunities to be thoughtful about how we shift uh, revenue and tax liabilities and uh, responsibly between uh, jurisdictions. And uh, one last thing for those of you that missed the first poll question that did not have a chance to answer that one in the question pod uh, due to the confusion of, of the methodology, I will go back and show that first polling question in just a moment. Uh, any last thoughts or comments, Kirk, Brian? No, I think the big takeaway you've got it, Sarah, is right there that, uh, you know, we're looking at a very different environment. We haven't seen anything even quite like this since the 08 financial crisis. And also looking at maybe higher taxes on the uh, in, in the future. What, what does that look like to our businesses and how do we navigate and manage that? It, it's a big paradigm shift for all of us. And uh, we thank you for listening today. Thank you. Okay, I will go back to uh, question, uh, poll question one, sorry. Um, I just skipped ahead one, there we are. For those of you that did not get a chance to answer number one, please go ahead and type uh, one and then either A, B, C, or D. And we have your uh, login, so we know that uh, you uh, were here and were answering. So thank you very much for that today. And of course, if you have questions for Kirk and Brian, they're available. Their contact information is in the materials. Uh, and also, there will be a recording of this webinar posted on our firm's website. Chrissy, any comments about uh, CPE before we close off? All right. Well, then that is all for today. We thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll leave the uh, 
uh, the webinar open for just a few more minutes. If uh, you wanted to leave any final notes or comments in the questions box uh, to make sure that we have your attendance recorded for today. So thank you again, and uh, we look forward to sharing more information with you uh, next next month. Have a good Fourth of July weekend.